Hi, my name is Carlita Jesus, also known as Spirit Jones. In a month or so, I'll be age 51, and I made it. I love butterflies. I um, Right now, I'm living with my parents who are so loving. They're taking care of me um, due to a lot of things that I can't do for myself. So I'm so grateful to my parents. My mother is 70, and my father is 65 and they are the best loving parents. Right next door, in the house next door to my parents, um, is my loving brother and his loving, loving wife, my um, stepsister, my sister-in-law, along with their children who I adore. They're so precious. And um, I, I don't have any children, but those are my children. So I have an eight-year-old nephew, who was the first nephew ever in my life, so I spoiled him tremendously. Then my brother and his wife had a set of twins, and now I'm spoiling them. So I would say that I am a loving spirit, a warm spirit, a butterfly spirit, which is how I came up with the name Spirit Jones. And I was using that that last name, um, Spirit Jones, because I was thinking about doing other things in my career, such as writing a book, maybe even having different platforms in life where I would use Spirit Jones, who again is a person who loves to live life, who loves to advocate for people, including myself and others. And I'm just a happy, loving spirit, a person that God has made to put here on earth to make sure that I make my mark and to do His will in helping others. I was diagnosed as de novo stage four metastatic breast cancer, where there is no cure but only treatment. And I was diagnosed with that about three years ago. I had um, some weird, odd complaints that I had given to my doctor. The first was a rash underneath my right arm. But then six months later, the same kind of rash appeared under my left arm and it was more intense. And I wanted to know more like, what is this? Why am I getting a rash on the arm? And then there was pain in the left side. So I had pain while I exercised. And so one day I was in the gym exercising and that pain was so excruciating. Um, I tried to stretch out the pain. It wouldn't go nowhere. So I went to the doctor for the pain and she said that I worry too much. There's nothing going on. Um, then I participated in a, um, a OCR, an obstacle course race, where you run on the obstacle course, you pick up heavy items, you run half a mile with these heavy items, and you continue to do that for four or five hours. And I was doing this obstacle course with a group of friends, but I started to have this excruciating pain in my left breast along with this obstacle course training. So the next day I called my doctor and said, hey, there's something going on. I have pain on my left breast. I think that I need another mammogram. And my doctor's words were exactly this. You already had your first mammogram this year. You had a repeat mammogram because your, your dense breast was so thick that it was difficult to see through. So they gave you a second mammogram. He said, there's nothing wrong, everything's benign, you worry too much. I didn't like hearing that. It really bothered me to hear the doctor say, I worry too much. I care about my body. And if I'm gonna advocate for other people, what do I look like when I'm advocating for myself? So I knew to put this in writing and I went to the patient portal, put this in the patient portal email and, um, changed the, the pain level of my pain when I emailed the doctor and said, not only is it a pain level, um, it really wasn't a pain level six. I told her it was a pain level nine. Um, and I knew that that would be her attention. Plus it's in writing, you have to respond appropriately. More than just telling the patient that the patient is nervous and they worry too much. So she gave me a referral, which is what I wanted to the women's doctor's clinic, the women's clinic, breast clinic. 
And so with that being said, um, the nurse practitioner took one look at my breast. Now from the time that the referral came to the nurse practitioner actually looking at me was a period of two weeks. And within two weeks, the shape of my breast changed, the size changed, and it grew very, very hard as if it was a, 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 a grapefruit. It was so hard. So the nurse practitioner, she felt it, she did the examination, she used an explicative out loud and said, anything this hard and this large should have come to me a long time ago in the referral. And that didn't make me feel happy about my relationship with the general practitioner. So they ran tests, blood tests, and the nurse practitioner told me that she had about 28 years of experience in her field of, of, of um, oncology and working with women. And she suspects that I have a provisional diagnosis of breast cancer stage 3B is what she said, but let's wait for the results to come back and wait for a doctor to be with me. I said, okay, fine. I went home and I collapsed in my family's arms. I picked up my niece and nephew from the babysitter and they were in the little, um, in the little car carrying seat. And I put the babies down, went to my brother. He saw the look on my face and I said, I have breast cancer and I collapsed in his arms. My father was there and they just hugged me. We all made a hugging circle and I cried and everyone else was crying as well. And I told them the story leading up to that moment and that now it's just time for us to wait to meet with the surgeon and a medical doctor to get the rest of the information. When I got up days later, I got a phone call from the doctor who supervised the nurse practitioner. And the doctor was an oncologist. And the doctor once wanted to know if I was at home or if I was at work. I told her I was at home. She wanted to know if I was alone or with family. I said, I'm at home alone. She suggested that I do a three-way call because she had some news to tell me. And um, she wanted to let me know that it's confirmed stage four. And that was how she told me my stage four diagnosis. It was over the phone. Yes, we have stage four breast cancer. There's no cure for it, but there's only treatment. And my mother was on the phone just as my sister-in-law was on the phone. And all I can remember is after she said that, my ears were ringing and I, I can't, I didn't comprehend much else of the conversation. Later on, my mother and sister-in-law came and got me and went into the office and she further explained the treatment that I was gonna get. My arm was swollen because I obviously had a, another condition related to breast cancer, which is called lipidema, which makes your arm swollen and you have to wear a sleeve to keep it from swelling so much. It makes your arm significantly bigger than the other arm, which is what you look like. So all this bad news is just hitting me left and right, and all I could do for comfort was to be around my family and read the Bible and pray. So that's just pretty much how it started for me. And it was just like a roller coaster of just bad news. The feeling I felt at diagnosis was anger. I felt like I was angry at me. I felt like it was really insensitive for the oncologist to give me my diagnosis over the phone while I was sitting at home. I know she probably tried her best to tell me to um, three-way call family members, but I was at home by myself. And I just don't think that that's safe to do. No, I wasn't suicidal, but I, I, I can't remember much beyond my ears even. And I looked up and then, you know, 20 minutes later, my sister-in-law and my mother were there to take me to meet the doctor in person. But, you know, the nurse practitioner saying um, that she, she's glad that I advocated for myself. That made, that gave me a source of strength for her to tell me that. But my general practitioner, I'm angry at her to this day because she didn't listen to me. And doctors need to listen to patients, you know? 
all these signs and she told he missed it. She told me that when she thought he probably was doing the right thing by uh, making sure that um, the referral came in for a second mammogram. But beyond that, what happens when the second mammogram says, we didn't see much, it's still too thick, too dense for us to see. Oh, come back in two years, um, you passed the mammogram. Liver was the main site of where it had metastasized to. Then it metastasized to my lungs. To this day, three years later, I am not able to breathe without the oxygen machine and the cannula that's going in my nose. So <clears throat> one of my lungs, my left lung, is completely gone. There's no, I have no use of the left lung. The tumors are in my left lung and I cannot use it for breathing. My right lung, well, the tumors are starting to fill up the right lung as well. And um, I have not bothered to ask the doctor how much longer I have to live. I don't want to know that information. I don't care because I'm here on earth to do as much as I can to live a full life. And I don't want that looming over my head. I also have it spread to my spine, the back muscle, the inner back muscle and uh, my spleen. In fact, there's more places that nets have spread than I can tell you. I think it's a part of my leg, um, the pelvis area as well, the pelvis muscle and the pelvis bone. Area. So I'm walking a little, my gait when I walk is a little unsteady when I walk. Um, I gave up driving. I am not as strong as I used to be. And I had an incident where I was rushed to the hospital because for some reason I had a small bowel obstruction. My stomach kept getting bigger and bigger one day and it stretched out so big, it looked like it was about to explode. So in the emergency room, they drained my stomach because I wasn't breaking down food properly. And when I left that hospital, I left that hospital needing physical therapy to teach me how to walk again. I needed occupational therapy to work with the fine muscles. And I needed a nurse, a home health nurse, to watch over me and, and to make sure that my vitals were okay. And since then, I've refused to drive because I don't feel strong enough. Um, it's very difficult for me to open up a jar of jelly or a jar of salsa and if my muscles and my motor control is not strong like that, there's no reason why I see that I need to be behind the car to drive. But essentially, the mess has affected my life in so many ways where I try my best to live a full life. But um, I'm great. So that my family is here. And um, it, it, it's just hit all over my body. And the doctors did not expect for me to live beyond three years. And I made it past three years. The very first appointment I went to was for um, a group of women around the corner from where I live. And it was made of mostly African American women. And it was very spiritual and uplifting. But I was the only person in that group who was stage four. The rest of the women were stage two. There was a stage three woman there with inflammatory breast cancer. So I was very pleased and very happy to meet her. But her treatment needs were so different than my treatment needs. So I found another support group and it happened not to be filled with African-American women, but this time it was filled with a group of women who were Jewish. And in that group, it was a stage four support group. And so the women in this group happen to be like me, very assertive, very outspoken, um, and, and, and very courageous. And so the women in that group kind of gave me tips on what to say to doctors to get the results that I wanted, or to just develop a better relationship with an oncologist. And, um, the tips and the words and phrases that they gave me, I would take to 
various oncologists because I've had a total of four oncologists. Um, and so I would say to, I've been called, um, I've been called demanding. I've been called pushy. But when I went back to the support group of Jewish women, they said none of the doctors had ever called them that. So I knew that it was much more than just that. I knew that this was also very race based and very race biased. And I knew that I was dealing with this. In fact, I found out that African American women die at a 40% higher rate than white women who have breast cancer. And I believe that one of the reasons why is because um, doctors don't value the same things that Black women value, or they think they don't. Yes, African Americans care for their health, but you never know unless you ask each and every single patient you have who happens to be African American. So you can develop a rapport instead of instead of you know um, using microaggressions or using stereotypes to to, to kind of paint with a wide brush of what this one person may or may not need. And so I think that doctors are having a difficult time interviewing, asking the appropriate questions, and just kind of brushing an African-American patient off. Some of the experiences as a Black woman, I definitely have been um, challenged with. For one thing, I was, I was already scared. This was even before my diagnosis of breast cancer. I was born into a situation not to trust doctors because I might become a guinea pig or an experiment. And so I was heightenedly scared with that fact. So all of a sudden I found myself stage four and at the mercy of the doctors. And that's another reason why I brought some of these friends with me. Things go on, people do things to hurt other people, and I did not want to get hurt by anybody. African Americans have a history of being hurt here in America all the time, and our lives are not valued. And so with breast cancer, it's the same thing. We want the doctor to give you quality care and to not overlook anything, not a single thing in the medical chart, or not to overlook any need that you may have. You want the best top quality care. You want, you, you don't want to be, you know, like the 40% statistic. So as you can tell, there's a lot of fear regardless of how stoic I may look. I'm frightened all the time and I try my best to be brave, but I just don't want anyone to hurt me. And so those are the things that we talk about in our African American group. And these are the issues that a lot of African American women face issues of clinical trials. Some of the health disparities that I've experienced, well, for one thing, it was being underdiagnosed. And I don't think it was done on purpose. Uh, some health disparities that I've seen other women go through is, um, you know, doctors not explaining things to patients. And so one woman from a support group told me that she doesn't ask questions. She just sits there and the doctor just does what she does. And I said, well, are you comfortable in that situation? Because some people like to trust the doctor like that and to say, just do what you need to do, doctor. I trust everything that you're going to do. I'm not going to ask any questions. And the woman said, yes, yeah, she just needed help in phrasing her questions in order to answer them. Um, there's several disparities, but I can't bring them up to mind right now. Even um, transportation. Um, doctors always want to know how far you live, and if coming to them is too far. It almost feels like they're trying to get rid of you when they have that. Like, oh, you live in the city of such and such in Culver City. Isn't it too far for you to drive over here? And no, it's not. That's not the concern. I'm here for a reason. I want to be here. You know, did you ask the next person that? Um, radiation. One time I was in 
a radiation therapy, um, giving radiation on my left side. And I noticed that my radiation oncologist, I overheard her conversation with a different patient. And she was totally bubbly and friendly. And it was almost as if they were friends. But then when she came, when she came with me, she was old and very straightforward. And it was just really odd. Because, you know, I try and make it a point to get that type of relationship with doctors. So I didn't get the warm, bubbly peace like I would have liked to have received from her. There's a lot of racial disparities that come out in so many different ways. I recommend that you look at your doctor and say, I'd like to talk to you. This is what I need from you. I need for you to tell me the truth. I know that you don't want to read through every word in the 17 page report that just came out from my from my MRI scan. However, if I can read this and take it home, I'd like to be able to call you back later. Uh, and you call me back so that I can understand some of this and you can go over some of these terms with me later on after I try and understand them on my own. I'd like for you to also explain things to me. Um, and you might want to say as if I were a five-year-old child. So a lot of people are comfortable saying that. That lets the doctor know to break the information down. I'm comfortable saying that. Please explain this to me as if I were a five-year-old child. And that way, I get the information so it's not any um, beyond language terms. It's kindergarten terms. <laughs> That's what I recommend. Open your mouth, speak, write it down on note cards, practice with someone at home, and then have that conversation with your doctor. I really need to understand what's going on. I really need to understand about hospice. When will you tell me about hospice? When will you not tell me about hospice? What are the conditions? Um, what's the difference between hospice and palliative care? And when would you ever suggest that? And why would you suggest that? And what is it going to look like? And you just ask, you just have to leave before you just ask. I've been to a conference or two, and um, I was able to listen to Metaviver and some other conferences. And the women are out there, the black women, the brown women, the Latinx women are definitely out there and want to participate. Um, I think it just takes a little bit more effort, not a lot, of the sponsors and um, people who are writing who are writing the literature to go into the churches. I know I've been approached several times to see if I can go into a few mega churches and, and, and get people to participate there. And at the time that I was going to, I got very ill and I couldn't do it by myself. I was energetic and the next thing you know, I wasn't energetic at the time. But the big place is me to have people who look like me going to the churches where you can really hit the congregation of African American women to get them to participate. You can go to health fairs. You can go on the radio. But if you don't want to buy time on the radio, you can find other ways um, to meet with African American women because I'm noticing with even support groups online, um, they're always looking for someone. And I get a text message from another African American woman saying, hey, are you interested in this clinical trial? So we're doing it word by mouth um, when, when I get contacted. And when I say we, us African Americans are passing along information or by mouth when we hear about opportunities for breast cancer awareness. And it's just, it seems like there's just not enough connection and enough dialogue going on to make sure that you, you have your pool of African American women to pull from to, um, to participate. I think you need to start at the churches as African Americans are very religious and very spiritual, and you can find women there.
my story is important to share because I don't want another woman to have to suffer like I've suffered through jumping through loops and trying to find the truth. It's very frustrating when no one has that answer. Sometimes oncologists don't even have an answer and it may not be their fault. But, uh, you know, when you're searching for answers and searching for the truth about your diagnosis, it shouldn't be that hard. But some doctors are, are um, gingerly in how they give out information. Other doctors are straightforward and you have to figure out which type of doctor you prefer to work with. I like doctors who are straightforward so I don't have to try and guess what they're saying. Give me my information straight and I'll deal with my feelings later on after I leave the office. Give me my information. I am intelligent enough to decipher what I want to do. Let me know about all of my treatment options first. And so I just really think that it's very, very important for other women to understand that you need to create a dialogue, write notes down, email yourself notes, write information down the day before you visit your doctor with questions. Go ahead and get journals. Join other groups as well. So you can search the internet, look for support groups in your area, and you don't have to um, only be a member of one group. You can join as many support groups as you need be because you're gonna get something different from each group. Like I said, one group is very spiritual and it's still, it's still my spiritual need. Um, but they didn't have a lot of stage four people in there. And the other group that I joined, everyone was stage four and everyone was outspoken and had already been through what I had been through. Just picture yourself going through the trauma of being on a roller coaster and behind that roller coaster um, is a bear and a tiger and they're both trying to get you. Suppose the roller coaster stops when you get off the roller coaster. Now the bear is chasing you and the tiger is chasing the bear. And that type of situation just never stops. That's how it felt initially. And if I could prevent another woman from feeling that way, that chase of trying to stay alive, trying to gather information, trying to get a caregiver, trying to explain to your caregivers what, they, what you're going to need from them, trying to make sure your caregivers aren't burnt out. It's very, very important to know where resources are as well. It's important to know that you don't have to drive so far to get a mammogram and there's uh, mammograms in your area. However, if you choose to drive far, far from your home because you know that care outside of your neighborhood is better, and it's true that um, care within the African American community may not be as precise as it is in the white community and you choose to drive to a white community for service, that's your choice and that's okay to do. That's exactly what I did. I saw the services in my neighborhood and I was not satisfied with it. And I, I go to support groups and I get services at least about 20 miles from where I live. And I can afford to do that right now. But if you can't afford to do that, you still can look for the best doctor in your area to get your help. And I don't want anyone to have to face the situation that I face. Barry Jones is here for a reason. Barry Jones, I want people to understand that you have an option to ask your doctor, you negotiate terms with your doctor to have a 3D mammogram or a 3D MRI. I'm here not to die. I'm here to live with stage four and to tell you that your, your choices in life, the things that you do, your caregivers, all work harmoniously together. I think that we need uh, in National Metastatic Breast Cancer Day. Um, I think that we need to have, if it hasn't been done yet, I think that we need to do more in Washington, D.C. Um, along these lines of metastatic breast cancer. It needs to be political. It's 
been difficult living with MDC. I had body changes and it's very difficult for me to be humble about how my body has changed. Changed. I'm grateful to be alive, first of all, but there was a vain part of me where I've lost so much weight. My clothes get baggy on me. I, um, I physically look a little ill, so when I walk out in public, um, people can tell that I'm struggling with something. I wear a wig whenever I feel like it, and um, in fact, I take off a wig whenever I feel like it. And so here I am with my wig taken off, and I go in public without my wig all the time because it's more comfortable. Um, today I went to see a friend and I just wanted to doll myself up, but it's the body image that is difficult to deal with. Losing your hair can be very traumatic for some women. Um, I did fun things with my hair. I, as my hair was thinning, I dyed my hair blue and I would go to work like that. And I was concerned that I would be judged as being an unprofessional person. And I'm sure that there were whispers from supervisors who said that about me. But I've had 20 years in the game of my career. So I really could care less of what they said about um, me being a professional. My work speaks for itself, and it's not a professional. So I had to just make fun with it. Another difficult thing is just losing independence and admitting that you need help. I can no longer stand up for a number of, of seconds or a number of minutes before I get tired. That means I cannot make meals for myself. My family, my mother does most of the meal preparation and she cooks for me. I feel so guilty that my mom has to help me out in the way that she does instead of my mother sitting back and enjoying her retirement during her years, being 70. Um, so I can't make meals for myself. I would say a third thing is watching life go on before your eyes and you can no longer participate in those things that you used to participate in physically. I used to have fun doing obstacle course races with my team of people. And I'm still in contact with my team. I have a very good support system that I'll tell you about later on. But just watching people as life goes on and you want to be happy for them, there's weddings, there's babies being born. And you can see that when you die, that's it. Life continues to go on, whether you're here or not. And while you're here, while I'm here, I would like to participate in some of those things that I can no longer participate in. And at the end of the day, I have to say a prayer and say, thank you, God, for my life, for whatever part of my body is working, for my ears that can still hear. You just have to learn about gratitude. And that will get you through. I had a dog. He passed recently. If this interview happened a month ago, I could tell you because my dog would be here. She passed a month ago. That my dog brought me the greatest joy. Dogs are so loyal. And uh, you see I'm smiling right now as I speak about her. She was absolutely my best friend. Um, and she's gone now, but I enjoyed rubbing her belly while she was here. Another thing that brings you joy is my support group. I um, I have friends who love me immensely and I love them immensely. My friends have literally gone to the doctor with me when I was scared. I did not trust doctors. And I don't know if I forgot to tell you all that. But after having that bout with the doctors, I was too scared to be in the doctor's office with someone. And so my friends would come to the doctor's office with me. Sometimes I had as many as five people, and I know that's excessive, but I was really frightened of the doctors who would come with me to the oncologist visit, come with me to scan appointments, and I appreciate my friends. They have packed up my house and I'm living with my parents now. I still have a, a home that I have to take care of myself, and my friends with me laying down in bed at my parents' house. Uh, 17 of my friends went to my house and packed up my house 
full of boxes and stuff for me. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my friends. And I'm also grateful for my family, for my nieces, my nieces and my nephews. They bring the best joy. I love to be loved to play pickle, especially with the young ones. Um, and they like to play hide and seek with me. And although I can't run through the house, I can pretend like I'm playing hide and seek with the little ones. The older one, he's eight, he loves to ask questions about why this or why that. A dinosaur is fake or real, auntie? They're, they're fake. Well, why when we went to the zoo, why was there a cage if they're fake and they're safe? I mean, it's little bitty things like that that make life so important. It, it make me cherish family and friends and dogs. COVID has been challenging. Um, COVID has everyone inside the home, especially several months ago when COVID first broke out. No one really understood or knew what was going on. I had a couple of different oncologists. I had to work through the fear that I had of leaving home and going to a cancer treatment center for treatment. Um, COVID has really brought my family together as we quarantined and stayed inside the home together. We learned to get closer. We had funny arguments. We had serious arguments. We had barely been able to express how we feel about one another. We've been able to grow with one another um, in terms of communication. You know, and it, it, you learn things. When you sit still, you learn things about yourself. You learn things about your family. And you grow, in my case, I feel more compassionate about my family. Um, COVID is, is really, is really had people come inside and just think about things. Another thing is that people wanted to visit me and I had to put a stop to that because I don't know if the person who wanted to visit me is putting them themselves at risk of COVID. Are they going to the barber shop? Are they going to the nail salon? Are they going to places they're not supposed to go? Are they exposing themselves around people and not wearing masks? I can't have anyone doing those activities and exposing themselves to come visit me here in my home and put me at risk. So what we did is when people, some people wanted to visit me, um, I let them sit on the porch and I stayed about six to 12 feet away. And that's how I had a visitor. But it's important to quarantine example, and to stay abreast on what's going on at the meeting. I don't go grocery shopping. My mother goes to the grocery. I can't, I can't even remember how long it's been since I've been inside of the grocery store. So I don't put myself at risk by doing any of those things. Sometimes we all deliver, have food delivered to the home so that we're not putting ourselves at risk as well. I think that a telehealth visit is, is appropriate and it's okay now. Um, I've also had video visits as well where we talk on the phone and we can see each other face to face similar to Zoom. And so when my doctor got to know me very well, I felt comfortable with the telehealth visit. But if I'm trying to explain something totally new that they are not familiar with, I would prefer an in-person visit. I think that you just have to really think about it, speak up, and, and make your needs known, especially if the doctor is not used to you or if you have something new going on. You have to let them know and emphasize that. Advice to someone who's been newly diagnosed with the COVID pandemic going on would really need to read all the literature that you have from your doctor's office or use the referral in the hospital that has been given to you. Hopefully, um, a case manager or a nurse practitioner 
a social worker has reached out to you, if they have not reached out to you, get on the phone, call your doctor's office and, and make an appointment so that you can get information. Nurse practitioners, case managers, and social workers are full of information and they can give you 1-800 numbers and numbers for additional help, support groups, um, places to go and get medicine, how you can get your medication delivered to your home so you don't have to stand in the pharmacy line. If they're just full of, uh, that's the best advice that I would give you. And also to search the internet to join an online support group for people who are newly diagnosed. There's so much information out there um, that you can be pointed in the correct direction to be around like-minded um, individuals. I keep perseverance and the definition of perseverance very basic for me. Either I sink or I swim, and I am going to flow and I'm going to swim. I'm not going to sink. And I try my best to get all the information that I need. I try my best to make sure that my oncologist needs are met by me as a patient. Developing a good relationship between myself and the oncologist, like I said, is so important. So making sure that um, relationships are nurtured is important because yes, I'm the patient, but I, I don't want to have a bad relationship at all with my oncologist. Um, also persevering to make sure that um, my choices in life are, are, are met. Um, from the pharmacy, I could be standing in line, for example, and making sure that the pharmacist knows just exactly what top I need. Sometimes the top on the medication makes it difficult for me to un unscrew because of this hand and I can't really do much with the can, it's very weak. And so um, I remind the um, pharmacist of the specialized help that I need. But I refuse to sit down and just let life happen. And for me to just salt in the corner and die and feel sorry for myself. I don't want anyone looking at me with sad, puppy dog eyes and, and feeling a sense of um, shame for me. But that's not what it's about. Perseverance for me is staying on top of my game until I can't do it anymore. And when I can't do it anymore, I trust that my family will take off and take good care of me when they have to step in. I don't want a single person to put guards in me. I want people to know that I'm making it through this the best way I can and to be happy for them.